everybody. Today we're talking all about using folklore in your writing. That means ancient tales, mythology, cryptids, all that good stuff. We're talking about how to utilize it in your writing in a way that's original, that speaks to your passion, and is respectful to the source material. And I'm super excited to announce our special guest, dark fantasy author and creepy core and folklore podcast hostess, Iona Wayland is here to tell us everything there is to know about writing with folklore. Iona, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi there, I'm Iona Wayland. I'm a dark fantasy author of Ashes. I'm a podcaster of Creepy Court and Folklore. And I'm super excited that I get to talk about all the creepy stuff today. Yes, we are super excited to have you here. If you haven't read her dark fantasy novel, Ashes, First of all, you gotta do it. It is literally one of the best novels I read in the last decade, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I loved it so much. Did it make me cry at the end? Maybe a little bit. I'm, I'm just saying, if you want your heart ripped out of your chest, you definitely gotta read it. Ashes is such a perfect example of utilizing existing tales and cryptids while putting your own unique spin on them. Plus, Iona talks about all sorts of folklore in her podcast, so if anyone knows her shit, it's her. Before we get started, a quick announcement all of the merch from my merch store is on sale right now for 15% off using code FOLKLORE. So if you want to pick up t-shirts, stickers, mugs, maybe some hoodies, now is the time to do it. It's all on sale for 15% off. You can also pick up merch featuring our local cryptid, Princess Buttercup. Say hello. Say hello, little lady. She will be here for the whole stream uh, taking a nap on my lap as she often does while I film. Okay, good buddy. The merch store is linked below, check it out. Now, Iona, are you ready to tackle these questions? Yes, I'm ready. Awesome. Starting with number one, what genres work best for utilizing folklore? Really any genre can use folklore. There's just a way to use your like intentional decision-making skills to choose what folktale works best there and making sure that the tone matches. Retellings are really, really prevalent and they can be given a modern twist or a contemporary twist. And so really making sure that the tone matches where like you want it to show up. So for instance, if you're doing a rom-com you would not want to use like the juniper tree folktale that is like one of the darkest in my opinion however you would maybe want to use ones that are like cinderella-esque or rapunzel-esque well now i feel like rapunzel's true origin is pretty dark but still you get what i'm trying to say <laughs> making sure that the tone matches the genre is really important yeah i see a lot of people say that you can only use folklore in fantasy or more supernatural types of stories uh and that just isn't true i mean i I bring up Cinder Nanny a lot. That is a retelling of a modern day contemporary rom-com of yep. Cinderella. Yeah. That's folklore. So you can totally mm -hmm. use it in any genre. It's just like you said, you know, maybe use an appropriate folklore or mythology for the genre. Uh, there's a lot of retellings of the house of the fall of the house of Usher that probably wouldn't work for a romance. Unless but... it's like a horror romance. Right, right, and maybe. Right. <laughs> And I was going to say, yeah, like I could see it for a horror novel, but maybe not like a rom-com. Be aware of the tone. So second question, let's talk research. What are the best researching methods you found personally? Personally, I like to use books that are written by someone that has that folklore background in their education or as their special interests or their area expertise in some sort of way. I think also it's best to actually read the original fairy tale. That can be really helpful. And that way you can kind of make your own interpretation and see what parts of the original fairy tale or folk tale speak to you. And it's really fun because folklore is available everywhere. They'll usually be a part of the public domain space because they've been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, depending on the tale. Also, it's just fun to Google or YouTube it to hear other people's perspectives, because once I personally have read the original fairy tale, I kind of get my grip on what it is, but then it's really nice to see other people summarize it and see what they think is the most important part or what moved them or freaked them out the most. Another thing I wanted to add, and this is just a personal preference, everyone, you're allowed to do what you want, but specifically when it comes to fairy tales, we see a lot of retellings of the Disney version of fairy tales. I see a lot of 
the Little Mermaid retellings and a lot of Cinderella and especially Beauty and the Beast retellings. And it's always the Disney version. You know, you're allowed to do what you want to do, but just understand that that format of retelling is pretty oversaturated mm -hmm. and we're not seeing a lot of retellings of the original fairy tale or mm -hmm. um even you know retellings that even if they draw from disney they are so different it is their own story a great example of this would be ella enchanted that book is so different from the original cinderella but it still is very close to its roots so just something to keep in mind that the original source material offers a wealth of imagination and inspiration so consider going to the beginning. Question number three, how do you build an original idea around an existing piece of folklore? So folklore is definitely meant to grow and breathe with the times, in my opinion. So old ways of telling stories that maybe have spanned, like I was saying, thousands of years may not have the same relevant plot devices of modern day storytelling. Like I remember the some of the first times when I was really little hearing about certain fairy tales and being like, that's it, that's the end. Like, because there wasn't that rising action, climax, falling action, that kind of thing. And so we want it to be able to live and grow and be interpreted in our modern way of telling stories as well. But it can help to have a modern spin or a modern takeaway from an old story because ultimately folklore is an art form and how you interpret it and how into your modern work is just as important as the story itself. I'm going to keep using basic examples like Cinderella because that's mm -hmm. something that pretty much everyone's heard of Cinderella. There are elements of Cinderella that a lot of like modern audiences think is ridiculous. Even if you look at the Disney version or the original version, it's like he can't remember who this woman is, except like he needs to get her to fit her into feet. a shoe, you know, or, like, like look at her feet. Yeah, there, there are modern ways to tell the story where it will make sense. Like I, I read a lot of Cinderella romance retellings and they don't have him forget what she looks like. You know what I mean? Like there, there are ways to modernize it for an audience that gets rid of some of the elements that are like, yeah, that worked back then, but today it's not not gonna mm -hmm. fly people aren't gonna buy it yeah or they're gonna think that the person is really shallow if they don't remember what somebody looks or, like or you know foot fetishes are popular and that's fine. you know what i love to see an erotica with like a cinderella foot fet type of it probably already exists we just, you know what it probably does comment below the the cinderella foot fetish erotica and we will read it <laughs> Number four, is there a line to draw between utilizing real world folklore and adding your own creative spin on it? This will depend on the person. So in my own opinion, creation stories being used as retellings is a boundary that I personally have of not retelling because it's integral to that person or people's and their belief systems on like, what their life is based on. For instance, for some folklore, it's considered a religion. So I would tread lightly personally because of this being a framework for somebody's faith. I think that's important to recognize, a especially when it's not your own faith. Unless you have your own interaction with that piece of folklore and or have sensitivity readers to make sure you're not perpetuating misinformation, I think it's best to steer clear of it personally. But also I know of people that will talk about their creation stories as if they are folklore or they interpret it as folklore, like the dragon mythos about how the dragons created the earth and just being able to retell that with reverence is really important, at least to me. So I think that's just my personal advice to give to somebody if they're deciding to use creation mythos in their fictional world. Yeah, I think bottom line, like there aren't a lot of lines in my opinion, but the mm -hmm. line is being respectful. Like, yes. you know, it's, and then, you know, obviously and we'll get into that a little bit more later. Number five, how important is it to utilize the original concepts from mythos as opposed to more modern takes and versions? For example, the original idea of the Fae and vampires versus more popular sexualized versions we see today. This will also depend on the person and personal preference. Sometimes it's one thing to be inspired by something. And there are many original concepts that are sexualized. That's part of 
of like maybe depending on the genre too what's going to happen but i personally don't write in that way but i can totally understand folks finding it thrilling or titillating titillating i said it so harshly <laughs> titillating i loved it it's like titillating Tit <laughs> Even though I personally don't write in that way, I can totally understand folks finding things like thrilling or sexy to write in that way. That's just not the genre that I'm tapping into at the current moment. Yeah, I agree. It, it really depends on the person and, and the story they're trying to tell. I mean, if you're writing about vampires and you're writing a romance, you're obviously not going to write them as monstrous and disgusting. You know, right. like, if I were to give a piece of advice, it would be that you can do this while steering clear of cliches. A great <laughs> example is Vela Roth. She writes a vampire um, like Blood Mercy series and it's like a vampire romanticy series and vampire romance is extremely common but her series and how she handles vampires is very unique and kind of separates her from everyone else because she did it she still made them sexy and still made them you know very titillating <laughs> <laughs> but she did it in a way that is different from cliche that we've been seeing ever since Twilight so it's right. you know she's doing her own thing. Number seven. Ooh, actually, this is relevant. What are the most tired storytelling cliches when it comes to creatures and folklore? I have a couple opinions. Here are my hot takes. Okay, so damsel in distress. Obviously, I'm going to say that one. I'm not saying because I do like whenever main characters can save each other. I think that can be fun. But whenever it's like purposely making one of the characters incompetent, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a femme character character either but just having that damsel in distress it's like kind of strange also anything that has the jaw that opens and then just keeps opening for a creature is something that's so overdone and it's been overdone for so long and i'm so sick of seeing people unhinge their jaw like they're a bunch of snakes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very common in horror, I think, you know? I think so, too, because I, I think that's where I see it the most is, like, it could be a ghost or a spirit or, e like, a creature or a reptile thing, and mm -hmm. it just, like, keeps unhinging its jaw and it opens and opens. And, like, the first time I saw that, I was like, what? But now I'm like, all right, we, we get, get it. it. Do something else that's scary. To add on to that, the most obvious one, I feel like anyone who watches my channel, they're going to know what I'm about to say, is right now the big trend is fey romance and romanticy. And I'm not saying saying don't write fae romance. Right. Um, but what I am saying is we're seeing a lot of replication of the exact same thing. Specifically, we see is a lot of replication of what the community calls the Bat Boys, where <laughs> every leading man is a white guy, but he has... Uh, Unusually brown skin, but yeah, no, but he, he's a white everybody. Yeah, he's a white guy who looks like a person of color and mm -hmm. has black hair, um, special eyes. He's got black swirly tattoos all over his body. He has wings. They may be angel wings, they may be bat wings, and he has shadow magic. And if there is some difference, it's like, no, 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 but this one doesn't have the wings. And it's like, okay, but he has everything else. It's the same replication of the Bat Boys from Akatar. Mm -hmm. And again, totally fine if you want to write fey romance, but there's a difference between writing something that's popular and just regurgitating something popular. I was going to say plagiarizing. I think regurgitating is nicer. <laughs> You said the quiet part out loud. But yeah, it it does border on, you know, plagiarism and we're, we're seeing a lot of that. It's to a point where, you know, I follow a lot of artists on Instagram and I will scroll through and I'll be like, oh, it's more Resand or Cassian art. And mm -hmm. then I look up and it's some character I've never heard of in a book I've never heard of. I'm like, oh, it's another fat boy fan fiction, you know? Yeah. And again, f fan fiction is fine, but we're talking about publishing novels, you know, to be consumed and purchased in the, the business world. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, just something to consider. It's totally fine to write something that's popular. I write romanticy, which is very on trend right now. You I love that it's getting a renaissance, by the way. I love yes! that romanticy <laughs> is popular again. I'm like, yay, we've been waiting for this moment. It's so funny. <laughs> because I started writing it when it was just whatever. And I'm uh -huh. like, wow, okay, I just picked a good one. But yeah, uh -huh. it, it, romanticy is very popular right now. There's nothing wrong with writing something popular or wanting to jump on a trend. It's just, you are creative enough that you could create your own leading man who is sexy. You we believe know? in you. We do. I, we I, believe in you and your sexy fictional men. <laughs> exactly.
exactly. You can you can do it. Oh, I also, you already mentioned this, but another thing that I feel like is getting cliche are the Disney retellings. They're not only are the Disney versions following this type of like animation storytelling that went on for like, oh, there's a whole history behind it, but basically they had to follow certain rules of what could be on television. And now those censorship rules really aren't in place anymore, but they also kind of are. Anyway, so the Disney version is a watered down or kind of quote family friendly version of the original tale. So not only is it not the original tale, but it's also the same ones over and over again. I would love to see all sorts of other folk tales. For instance, like the actual original tale of Rapunzel is like one of my favorite ones. It's so good. And then also there are some creepy parts to like Snow White is like really disgusting, the age differences. And same thing with Cinderella with like the revenge that she gets on her stepmother and stepsisters is pretty gruesome. So, oh, well, maybe that's just showing my true colors as a dark <laughs> MC writer. <laughs> um, but but also Sleeping yeah. Beauty is really gross. Sleeping Beauty is super gross. If you're writing a romance, I don't want to see the original version of Sleeping Beauty. No, 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 no. But what no. I'm saying, like, what I think what we're saying is you can do more than the Disney version, you know? Yeah. For example, there was a time when I wanted to do um, fairy tale retellings, and yeah. my versions were wildly different from the Disney version and the original. It was like mm -hmm. Cinderella was an assassin. I see books being advertised where Cinderella's that. a vampire, you know? And it's like, I, I would too. right. I would love to see that. You know, we're not saying you have to stick to the original. It's just no. that there's more than just the Disney version. And then also, like, if we get into mythology, we see a lot of it, like, everyone's doing Hades and Persephone. Everybody and does Hades and Persephone. And there's, yeah. no one's doing, like, which I'm still trying to pressure you into writing the Medusa book that you were oh, talking about, that you're secretly talking I, about. I, <laughs> I would love to do that. I would love to do one with Apollo. There are so many options. Jason and mm -hmm. Medea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, there are so many good options besides just Hades and Persephone. Number eight, how do you ensure you're utilizing folklore in a respectful way? So this is really, really important that you check in with yourself. There's a line behind finding something fascinating and then appropriating it. So recognize some of the reasons why you're interested. If it turns out that there are stories that you don't have a connection to specifically, that sensitivity readers tell you that is harmful and accurate or perpetuating a stereotype, it's very good to make sure your ears are open and you are open to changing certain aspects of your story because of that. Some folklore was set up in a propaganda type of way and created specifically to spread stereotypes. Examples of this that I go over in my podcast are goblins, the goblin episode that perpetuates anti-Semitism. It didn't originally start that way, but it kind of morphed into those kinds of stories. Same thing with werewolves. In my werewolf episode, I do a super deep dive into werewolves. And a lot of that comes from targeting folks that are people of color and disabled, especially with physical characteristics that people deemed, quote, different and evil. It's just good to know where those lines are and to make sure that just because you feel a connection to a story doesn't mean that you have to shut down any kind of feedback about that story. I also wanted to touch on there are some uh, folklore where the communities have spoken out and been like, please leave it alone. Like, yeah. please stop stop doing that. Um, specifically, more indigenous cultures are yep. like, you know, this is our culture. This is our religion. Please mm -hmm. stop using it. And then uh, mm -hmm. white writers are out there like, no. But I, I like it. And it's like, those are ones that I don't, I think it's no question. You just don't use those. And mm -hmm. I think if someone has to rely on a crutch of like, but I want to steal from you and I want to harm this community, then maybe they're not a really good writer. There are yeah. so many good stories out there. There's so much mythology. There, yeah. There is no reason to have to use that one. You don't even have to use any folklore. You you have a brain and an imagination. You could create yeah. your own thing. So there's just no excuse where it's like, no, but I have to. I have to harm these people. It's necessary. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are like, well, I don't get it. And it's like, well, you don't have to get it. Some people don't get calculus, but they know it exists. Whenever yeah. someone pushes that hard against like a boundary set by a group of people or just one person or a sensitivity reader and what they're trying to say, I think it shows going back to the very beginning of what I talked about is check in with yourself. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to tell this? I remember for Ashes, there was a particular thing I was using that someone pointed out to me that it was like, oh, just so you know, this has roots and whatever, and it's harmful to use it. I had no idea. The only thing that I was worried about was like, oh, 
shit, now I have a plot hole. So I was like, oh, I need to fix it. So right. I was just able to conceptualize a different creature in that particular aspect that did the things that I needed it to do to move the plot along. But it was like a 10 minute fix. <laughs> like, right. It and wasn't hard. It was more like the shock of like, oh shit, I didn't know kind of popped up. But other than that, like that was the, the worst of it. And as someone who has read Ashes, I cannot imagine it the previous way. I think it was an improvement. Thank you for Aww. saying that. I also, I think it made it strong stronger because it was like my own creation, you know, exactly. instead of relying my on baby. Oh, my child. <laughs> so moving on, number nine, how do you bring in real world mythology and folklore in a way readers will understand without massive amounts of info dumping? I think this one's a hard one for some folks just because they're so passionate about whatever tale they're telling. So write it knowing a couple different possibilities. One of those possibilities is that your readers can and maybe will do their own research into it. Also keep in mind that some of your readers will have extensive knowledge, perhaps even more so than your own. And you don't want your interest to cloud what the plot is trying to say. Just because you're passionate about your interest does not mean that it needs to leak into every aspect of your writing. I think it's important just to tell your straightforward story, keep to the plot that you're trying to convey and the themes that you want to convey if you choose to have themes, but like not having your interest just sprinkled throughout because it's like almost like too much seasoning at that point. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is one of those things where it's, you know, the readers don't care. <laughs> they don't give a shit. They're here to read your story. For example, if you're telling a retelling of um, Hades and Persephone, it's your version of it. You don't need to stop the story and be like, by the way, in the original, blah, blah, blah. Right. whatever's necessary for the story, you are going to put in it. And it you, you don't need to create all this background information. The readers don't care. All you need is what is relevant to tell this particular story and all that background and information and research you did, it, most of it's not going to be relevant. It's fine. And also there is beauty and joy in Easter eggs, like little tidbits of, yes. of information that harken back to the original. So for mm -hmm. example, like I use a lot of references to Greek mythology in the Savior Champion and I get really, really excited when someone writes me and is like, oh, was this in reference to et cetera, et cetera? I'm like, yes, you figured mm -hmm. it out. But it's not for everyone. I'm not going to pause the story and be like, oh, Ryan named after blah, 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 uh, because he is a hunter. Like, I'm not going to do that. But you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's some readers will figure it out and that'll be fun. But not every reader needs to know. I think that shows that you're keeping in mind the different types of readers. Like some don't fucking care. Some are like definitely going to look it up because they're curious. They're like, I don't know what this is, but I'm gonna look it up. And some are gonna be, have their interest align with yours. And you wrote your, your series for all three of those readers. And I'm in the, not that I don't fucking care, but I know <laughs> nothing about the original mythos at all. And I love your books. So like clearly it didn't take away <laughs> from the reading experience because I had no idea what was going on with the original mythos because you told mm -hmm. your own story thank you i appreciate it. i love how you're like not that i don't fucking care I don't. <laughs> i'm one of the ones that don't fucking care by but i do care just not. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing is it's like i'm the kind of person like i'm sort of in the middle like i'm the kind of person when i find out this is a retelling of something I, and i'm not familiar with it i go and like read it and i mm -hmm. like compare but some people aren't gonna care and that's fine you don't not everyone needs to be a nerd okay the nerds are welcome but not necessary exactly okay Okay, so this is my favorite uh, question. I saved it for last. Number 10, what are key ingredients to writing a monster or cryptid that is scary? Scary like butters. Ooh. Like butters. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck are you doing? So making the entity unseen is a way that um, I get my readers own imagination to fill in the gaps of what they feel like is scary and fill in those blanks based off of their own worst fear. Another thing to, not saying that it has to be invisible the whole time or un like a super secret the whole time because that could definitely drag if done for too long but I definitely think that like having it be unseen and having the reader fill in the blanks is fun also basing them off of your own worst fears is advice given by Octavia Butler she said originally like write down all your fears do not hold back because your intricate unique fears will be what makes your writing like unique in itself and be extra scary because you're not like holding back at all and i definitely did that like almost all of my worst fears are in ashes <laughs> also i like to make sure i connect with the elements of horror and just like as a quick recap and i totally googled it for <laughs> 
<laughs> the expression of this. Dread is the anticipation of something that's about to happen. The feeling of dread is one that I like to incorporate the most. I think it's because it has a lasting effect, in my opinion, on readers. Then the another element of horror is terror, and that's a state of absolutely overwhelming fear. It's like the moment it's happening. And then horror is like the after effect of it. So it's like shock or disgust is in the actual definition of what horror is. An intense feeling of shock or disgust that will happen after that shock or that terror goes on. But that apprehension or that dread that builds up, I love to build that up. I feel like for me, terror lasts the shortest amount. And then horror is kind of like how I express it through like the trauma that someone has afterward. Their brain is trying to cope with the original dread and terror where they're like, oh my gosh, I have to survive this because this might happen again. And it's like the steps that they take to try and avoid it, but it's not always avoidable. If I'm making sense. <laughs> you are absolutely making sense. I'm just like, yes. Oh my gosh. Like all this, you know, I don't write horror, but I do write some horrific moments. Oh uh, yeah, you definitely and do. <laughs> And when you talked about, right, your worst fears, I just immediately thought back to the key, keys to oh, key to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys aren't familiar in The Savior's Champion, there is a challenge that involves um, swimming in a dark ravine um, mm -hmm. to, to, <laughs> to, to uh, um, find keys on the, on the ground of the ravine. And swimming in the ravine are basically like what I would describe as giant dark zone fish. I did base them off of an existing fish. That no, really? No. <laughs> but it's an, no, no, but it's a tiny one. The fish is tiny. I just But you blew it, it up. That's yeah. kind of even more terrifying. It's yeah. kind of, it's like, oh, it would be a tiny and maybe kind of creepy cute. Like if you'd kept it tiny. I'll, I'll you send you a up. picture after this. Maybe Ew, have, no. Maybe, I want maybe to, I'll, but I don't want to. <laughs> I'll, I'll have them edit the picture into this video. But yeah, I based it off of a real fish and then I just made it huge because the deep sea life is both fascinating and terrifying to yes. me. So I so that like that's what I did. I was like, well this is this is scary to me, so it's gotta be scary to someone else, you know, and apparently it was to you. Yep, it was. <laughs> the other one that you wrote that made me really, really, really upset was the statue scene. I oh, don't yeah. wanna like give anything away but it's definitely related to that uncanny valley of mm -hmm. like is this a person it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a person <laughs> that for me is like beautiful in my mind but if i was experiencing it it's like that oh. scene from jason and the argonauts with talos and his head mm -hmm. slowly turns if i was experiencing that in real life i would literally shit my pants you oh know? absolutely i would just like lie on the ground like i'm dead like there's no use fighting <laughs> take this. me now that's I've seen the horrors this earth has to offer and I cannot continue. <laughs> I didn't know the difference between terror and horror and now I know and I'm like, ooh, I can use this, sorry. Whenever you're like, oh, I don't really write horror, I'm like, Jenna. <laughs> like, well, it's funny because- books are horrific. Like, and they're them dealing with it afterward too. It's funny because like uh, I don't find what I write very gory. And then I've got people in Cyborg Central like recently saying, you know, I knew there was gonna be gore in this book, but I'm literally dry heaving. And, and they're dry heaving <laughs> in a part that I find mild. And I'm like, oh, oh no, <laughs> hold on to your butts because it's gonna get a lot gorier in a couple chapters. This point has devolved, but what we have learned is that Iona is an expert on horror and terror and I, don't have any concept of it. So <laughs> you were still writing it even if you didn't have a concept of it. <laughs> I'm just writing it like this is nice. This isn't too much and <laughs> Oops. Anyway, this has been super fun. Thank you so much for joining us today. Tell everyone where they can follow you. I'm on Instagram and TikTok on at creepycore and folklore. You can find me there. I'm very active. I have a podcast also by the same name, Creepycore and Folklore, and it is available on all major and minor, honestly, uh, podcasting platforms as well as YouTube if you prefer like that stock of video. Also, you can visit my website, www.creepycoreandfolklore.com. And there I have my merch and my ghost interviews. And I can give you a crystal ball reading if you're really curious about that. And she's uh, good. She's always spot on. Okay. <laughs> I'm, like I'm gonna... she predicted a huge thing that was going to happen in my life. Uh-huh. And it was like far-fetched, I guess. And I was like, okay, whatever. And it was then pretty it fucking, specific. Yeah, it was very specific. <laughs> 
make very outlandish and then it fucking happened okay <laughs> it was a good thing though so don't worry it was a very yeah good thing. it's good it's a good news crystal ball reading i also have my dark fantasy novel out now ashes it's available in ebook paperback and audiobook on amazon and audible and i'm working on the sequel on jenna's live streams yay i'm so excited i have all of iona's information listed below follow her you will not regret it seriously she has great content definitely listen to her podcast it is fantastic it is creepy and cozy at the same time which is really hard to do but she she manages it great and also by ashes like i said it's one of the best books i've read in the last decade it is so good so creative very unique and it'll make you cry even your dark twisted cyborg heart cry i did not message you late at night like did you really do this to me <laughs> And Iona's just there like, <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoy dark fantasy romance, be sure to check out the first two books in the Savior series, The Savior's Champion and The Savior's Sister. They're award-winning books. They're bestsellers. So get on the hype. They're linked below. And if you'd like a step-by-step -step guide to writing your novel from plan to print, check out Shut Up and Write the Book. It's available at all major retailers and in all formats. It's linked below. Butters just popped up. She's like, yeah, go get my mama's book. Do it. I'm a sassy dog. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I post new videos on Wednesdays and I host live streams on Mondays. And if you want to be alerted as soon as I upload, ring that bell. Bye. Hey there, this is Lisa Cortland-Leone, narrator for Shut Up and Write the Book by Jenna Moresi. Be sure to subscribe to Jenna's channel and ring the bell. That way you're alerted as soon as she posts a new video. Trust me, you don't want to miss this stuff.